So I'm going to be introducing you to the attorney account manager, Mr. Anthony Ferris, and the chief neuroradiologist, Dr. Brad Shaw. Please help me welcome Diagnostic Imaging Services. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Where's Anthony? Okay. Blue shirt. Hey, good morning. I'm Brad Shaw. I do uh, the neuroradiology for DIS. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you uh, about was um, uh, a CT MRI fusion study. Now, uh, some of you are probably aware of this. We do quite a few of them. But if you uh, haven't seen this technology or don't know uh, much about it, I'm going to do a brief talk for about 15 minutes, show you some cases, and show how it would uh, help you with your clients and, um, and some of the questions we're answering for the neurosurgeons and orthopedists that we get spine referrals from. So a fusion study is made up of two parts. Uh, the first part of the study is a CT or MRI. Uh, it's the uh, typical CT or MRI that we, uh, that we do. Uh, and uh, basically what that is showing is anatomic uh, detail, uh, such as uh, disc pathology. And uh, this is the part of the study where we're classifying different disc herniations, protrusions, extrusions, uh, or angular disc bulges. Uh, we also see on CT or MRI fractures or subluxation, uh, and uh, this is the part of the uh, study where we're commenting on sty spinal stenosis, and importantly, um, nerve root uh, contact or impingement, whether it's a disc or a bone spur, contacting the nerve root, all that's coming from the CT and MRI report. What the fusion does is a little bit different. It gives us a different uh, type of information that is additive to the CT or MRI report. And the second part of the study is a bone scan, and we do it in three dimensions, and that bone scan is overlaid with the MRI or CT, and we read them together as one study. So what the bone scan shows you is what's actually happening to the bone at the time of the study. It gives you information that you don't get on the CT or MRI. Very often the CT or MRI may be negative and the bone scan may be markedly abnormal. So this is why the neurosurgeons and orthopedists order this. So how is this done? Uh, what we do is uh, it's usually performed on the same day that we do the CT or MRI. And the bone scan is an IV injection. It's an injection usually in the patient's arm. Uh, and um, what it is, is it's a phosphate analog that's taken up by the skeleton. So we do the injection, uh, we wait two hours, and then the patient is scanned. And what it's showing you uh, is bone activity. That's bone reformation that's happening at that time. So, you know, when we think of uh, the skeleton or bony structures, we kind of think of them in our mind as static, but that's not true. These are uh, always uh, undergoing remodeling. So if there is a stress or a fracture, the bone scan will be very abnormal. The lesion becomes very conspicuous uh, on the study, which is important for you or a jury. It's very easy to see the areas of abnormality and they are often negative on the MRI or CT. So we'll go through some cases just so you kind of get a feel of what it looks like. So again, the, the fusion, the bone scan part of the fusion is showing you what's happening to the bone right now. Uh, so uh, the fusion study is a combination of the anatomic information that we get from the CT or MRI and physiologic information, what's actually happening to the bone in terms of bone turnover on the bone scan portion. So this is what it looks like. This is the, uh, what the scan looks like to us, and this is what it looks like to the you know, referring physician, and you guys would get a copy of this as well. The top is the anatomic information, either CT or MRI. This is a patient who's having low back pain. The CT and MRI were negative. We don't see any bone pathology on those. And instead of this being the end, the, uh, the neurosurgeon had a high clinical suspicion somewhere in the lower lumbar spine that there's some pathology because it's a uh, pain right after an MBA. Uh, and this is the increased bone turnover here at L4 that correlated with the patient's um, pain. So if you're using a CT or MRI, you're missing about half the information that's there for that patient. Um, and um, this is um, the, the goal of the study. So many times, as I've alluded to before, the uh, MRI or CT may be negative. 
uh, or may have minimal pathology that's not really related to an acute traumatic event. Uh, and very often these studies will be markedly abnormal infusion studies. And uh, so this is a, another example of what a fusion study looks like. Uh, this patient obviously has some disc pathology here at L5S1. The bone scan is markedly abnormal. This patient had a, a flexion injury uh, in an MBA. So although we don't see a fracture on the CT, the bone scan activity correlated well with uh, the patient's pain and represented an acute injury as opposed to us just having a CT and seeing chronic appearing findings and then you're stuck there uh, without any additional information. Another area that the um, fusion study uh, is very helpful for is uh, facet pathology. So uh, you may have a patient, a middle aged or older, that has multiple levels of facet disease. I'm sure you guys have seen that in the reports, facet arthropathy or hypertrophy. The question is, does any of this represent an acute injury? Does any of this represent, you know, uh, pathology from uh, a recent MBA. And to sort that out, uh, what we do is we do the bone scan. So this patient had multi-level facet disease, but the trick is, is it new or old? Is it related to the injury? So uh, you can see how conspicuous it looks like on the bone scan. This is the bone scan overlaid with a CT showing uh, facet pathology at uh, C4-5. Again, uh, this is uh, the same patient, uh, uh, just uh, showing uh, that we can uh, see the uh, pathology in three planes. And it makes it very easy and conspicuous for the referring physician, uh, you know, the attorneys and the jury to see the area of abnormality. So uh, I, this is a recent study. This is a study I read last night, actually. This patient had, was scanned on the 21st. This is a 72-year-old. Uh, who had an MBA and it was a high clinical suspicion of lower cervical spine injury. Uh, so the, ortho, uh, the uh, neurosurgeon had ordered a fusion study knowing that this patient is going to have multi-level disease that we're going to see on the CT, but he needs to sort out what was new versus old injury. So this is the CT scan and looking at this, it, you know, there's multi-level disease. There's, you know, a bony defect here at C7. And there's multi-level disc space narrowing. Very hard to determine um, if there's an acute injury overlying this. Uh, so we fused it yesterday, hmm. and this is where the patient's symptoms are at C6-7, showing uh, markedly abnormal bone turnover adjacent to the C6-7 disc space, uh, and it allows the um, neurosurgeon to localize the area of acute injury overlaid by a multi-level chronic disease or degenerative disease. This is actually the same patient. Uh, this is the lumbar spine. And at L4-5 here, he has some bony changes. And again, we're still stuck with, is the, you know, he definitely has some old disease or degenerative disease. Is this area, has this area been affected by the trauma? Is there increased bone turnover at this area because he's symptomatic in the lower, lower lumbar spine? And then this is what the bone skin looks like. The areas of uh, orange or increased color are the areas of abnormal bone activity uh, that correspond uh, with the area of, uh, of disease um, and account for his new back pain after the, um, after the injury. Um, so I just wanted to uh, familiarize you with what a fusion study is. It's an overlay of a bone skin with a CT or MRI and uh, it increases the sensitivity of that study uh, with respect to new injury or post-traumatic injury overlaid with areas of chronic disease. So um, Anthony Ferris is gonna talk to you a little bit about the me mechanics of ordering it and how it works and the costs, and certainly I'm able to ask any, or able to answer any questions that you guys might have. So what's the additional radiation exposure? Yeah, so the additional radiation exposure is, well, with, um, for example, we do MRI, there's no radiation exposure, so this represents the only uh, uh, radiation uh, exposure, but it's about equivalent to uh, um, um, uh, five flights from New York to, to um, uh, LA as far as kind of overall exposure above background. So it's 
minimum, uh, well, how do we make a decision as far as radiation exposure and radiology is kind of risk benefit. Um, these often are ordered by the um, physicians that have a high clinical suspicion of, dis of disease. So if they don't have a high clinical suspicion, we're really not going to be doing the bone scan. We'll stick just with the MRI, which has no ionizing radiation. Okay. But how do compare it's lower than a CT, higher than an X-ray. Is that also known as a SPECT scan? It is. It's SPECT is um, uh, the 3D portion of it. Um, so SPECT uh, is just an acronym for single photon emission computed tomography. Computed tomography is CT, and that's the uh, 3D imaging of a bone scan. Tesla. You know, not every magnet is going to be the best magnet for the body part that needs to be scanned. 
we tend to like to use the three Teslas for the joints, right, Doc? And the brain as well. So uh, with that being said, um, and uh, if you speak to uh, many doctors here, you'll find out that the industry standard for scanning patients on MRIs strength-wise on the magnet is going to be 1.5 Tesla. Really, you don't want to deal with anything less than that. You know, the quality of the imaging is very important, not just for the attorney, as far as identifying the magnitude of the pathology, but also for the radiologist who's doing the read and the treating physician, you know, who is reviewing everything that the radiologist just put out, you know, and determining how to uh, 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 finish treating the client. So with that being said, again, the process is very simple. All you have to do is just give us a call, send an email, whatever is easier for you. And uh, you know, we'll take care of uh, the testing and uh, we'll give you a quick turnaround time and uh, send you a comprehensive package on the back end with your bill, your CD, and your reports. Does anyone here have any questions? What's the cost for one of those overhead That is a very good question. So you're doing a CT, you're doing a SPECT, and you're doing a fusion. So that's three modalities. You're looking at a total of $1,820, which in comparison to two other entities here in the state, which I will not name, um, is about um, half of what they charge. Okay. So uh, uh, that's pretty much about $5,000 at hospitals. Scott, you can attest to that. There are many attorneys over here that have reached out to me, just, you know, my God, Anthony, I just got a bill from this hospital. This is how much it's going to uh, cost me to do my exam. This is ridiculous. There's not enough money in the policy. My client's hurting. You know, we need to try to figure out a way to get to the bottom of what's going on. Yes. Come see us. We're significantly less expensive, and you're going to get the same level of quality. Okay, so with that being said, I'd like to introduce to you our next uh, radiologist, Dr. Uh, Bud Landry, uh, that uh, has been uh, a radiologist for 28 years. He's board certified. He is um, a graduate of LSU, and he also teaches there. And he's also known as uh, John Lithgow to uh, yeah. <laughs> some of his colleagues. Laugh it out, laugh it out, get it over. Yeah, well, Brad gave us, made some great points. MRI, the CT is money. It's incredible, right? MRI goes to the next level. We just blows it, everything out of the water, right? But not every CT and MRI looks out of the normal. The patients hurt. And when they hurt, why do they hurt, right? So we've got to figure that out. So the fusion, actually is a wonderful thing that, that I, I didn't do much of early on in my career, but now I'm, I'm recommending it because I'm, I'm hearing the history, I'm not seeing the, the findings that they correlate with that very well, but, but I mean, you can see the look in the patient's face, they're hurting, you can see it in their eyes, so, so it's an important. What I'm gonna do today is kind of touch on cervical spine. I have a couple of lumbar spine images too, just for grins, uh, but it shows pathology that uh, I think is important. So um, here's just a couple of little anatomy pictures. This is an open mouth odontoid view. And uh, I, I see some outside films come in and they don't really show me this view very well, but it's a great depiction of the, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. There. Uh, great depiction of the dens or the odontoid relative to the lateral mass of C1. Now, you try in your offices, uh, the, the uh, chiropractors will try, the internists will try, and they can't show us that. And then you get a report from an outlying place and it says normal or no abnormality seen. But I try to encourage people, look, open mouth, and if it doesn't work, get your patient to talk. So if they're talking, anything that's moving is gonna be fuzzed out on x-ray. So if you're moving your mouth, you fuzz out your teeth and your jaw, and you can see C12. So that's a little tip I give the technologists uh, at our place, but they, they don't really need it. They, they give us these kind of things every day. Uh, so, anatomy of the cervical spine. So this is an MRI example. So you're off midline on this study. So when we say parasagittal or foraminal, we're showing you the neural foramen. So the nerves exit. Here's a nerve here within the foramen, the facet joints over here. So yes, we look at the facet joints. I did in pain intervention for 25 years. I don't do it anymore, but I did. So I always read the MRIs and CTs as if I was going to intervene. I look for things that could explain the patient's pain. Right? So I'm going to mention the sentences in all my reports. It's going to get mentioned. If I don't see anything, but the patient has facet pain syndrome or bone pain, one side or the other, I'm going to probably recommend a spec fusion because I need, this guy's hurting. This lady's hurting from this, from this injury, so we need to do that. 
Um, so here's a, oh, I'm sorry, midline, back, midline image uh, on this same patient. Oh, God, okay. okay, midline image, and here's the disc herniation. And if you look at it, the disc is a little bit dehydrated, so it's desiccated, but this is high signal. So it's almost the same signal as the CSF. So in this case, I would mention high signal within the annulus, possibly a tear, edema, and hemorrhage, okay? And not only that, but there's also neurocompression. So the, the neurocompression on the spine is gonna cause a myelopathy, right? But there's also annular pathology, which could be painful. Uh, interestingly, my secretary's niece was doing a jumpy gym and had exquisite pain, couldn't move, crying hysterically, everybody, they wouldn't do anything, sent her home from the urgent care, you're fine, you're fine. A week later, I finally said, do the Danny MRI, bring it to New Orleans, we'll do it here. She lives in Madison, Mississippi. Anyway, she had an annular tear, a 12 year old. So it happens, and it hurts. I mean, people are profoundly debilitated. You can't see it on plain film. Sometimes you don't even see it on MRI because of the summation of getting a slice, it's a little too thick, and you've got bone there, and you've got spur there, and it, it kind of fuzzes out that area. That's why disc injections help, and that's why sometimes you see me, again, recommend a disc injection, because there's pathology, there's a disc herniation, there's a protrusion, there's really a lot of pain with motion. They, they can't stand, they can't sit for the lumbar spine, they can't really you find these patients slunched over. You've seen your clients like this. So I'll recommend a disc injection. This is what it looks like, uh, annular tear, associated with a disc herniation of cervical spine, okay? And again, so going through this right now, you can see that there's the herniation, and unless you window and level this correctly, you might not see the annular tear. So one of the questions that was asked of me, and this talk's gonna be a little disjointed, because I got a lot of questions in the last week to include, so I'm kind of starting to throw them in to talk. But the point is, other, why do some people not dictate it? Why do some imaging centers not mention the annulus or annular tears? And I think probably some, part of it is they do slice thickness that is too thin or too thick. They get summation or they just miss it. The slice doesn't go through the tear, okay? Um, and so that's important. Or the radiologist or neurologist or nurse or whoever's reading the study, they're not changing the window and the level of the image. They're not adjusting the intensity of the image. So they're washing it out or they're eliminating it from the image. So it's a, it's a tear, but they don't, they don't see it because they force it out of the visual image. Does that make sense? So, you know, if I, you, you can see me, but if I turn the light off, you wouldn't see me. But if you're reading like that and you, you change it to the point where you can't really depict it, then it doesn't mean it's not there. It just means you didn't see it. So I think they fail to mention it for those reasons. And it's not because they're just bad radiologists. I just think that they just didn't set it up the right way. All right, so in MRI, we do different sequences. We do what we call a T1. And why we do it is we want to do that to look at the anatomy. So it's a good anatomic morphology. We're just figuring it out, right? So we can't really say much about pathology because MR detects protons, hydrogen atoms. And water is H2O, so there are two hydrogens in a water atom. So we're looking for patholo pathologic water. In an area, it shouldn't be, okay? So in T1, if you look at this, this is anatomy, and this patient had a hyperflexion injury, right? Car, car wreck, whiplash, boom, forward, backward. If you look at it, you can see, hopefully, this vertebral body is normal, normal. This one's fractured. So there's a fracture here, inferior end plate and anterior end plate. So you have a fracture with a disc herniation and posterior bony protrusion. So there's a displacement along this fracture line, and this part of the bone is extending into the canal. So you've got neurocompression on the cord. Okay, so very well depicted on the T1 image. On the T2 image, is this acute or not? So the next question is, is it more likely than not that this is an acute injury? Well, that's, an, and I'll cover that in another slide, but it's important that we do a T2 to look for the edema. So now there's bone marrow edema. So we're looking for fluid. We want an image for fluid. And there you go. There's edema in that vertebral body along the fracture line, but also in the body itself. So edema is going to be there. And hemorrhage undergoes a degradation product over time. It goes from hemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin to methemoglobin and then to hemosiderin. It's just the way the, the, the bone, uh, I'm sorry, the blood or the hemorrhage ages, okay? And leave it up to us to tell you about when it is, but we can kind of date early on if it's a 
acute or subacute or hyperacute or chronic finding, right? So the question again, one of the questions I was asked yesterday is address acute versus chronic. Well, I can probably do it, but I need to do it early after injury. So if it's early enough after injury, I'm going to see edema and I'm going to see hemorrhage if it's when the first three to five days. If you wait six months, the hemorrhage has already gone away. Now you've got a black signal. Okay, black. And and so is cortical bone, so is the annulus, so is the, the uh, ligaments and the tendons. So they're all black. So then it kind of limits the radiologist to say, when was the injury? It was eight months ago. I can't really, I can't really tie this to that definitively. Early on, I can pretty much, pretty quickly say, I can figure that out. Yes, sir. What window of opportunity do you have after the injury to see that? You're going to see acute hemorrhage within the first day. You're going to see edema immediately. What's what's the you know, general? So, what's so the over time, so uh, up to about three or four weeks to five weeks, and then all of a sudden you get into the chronic stages of hemorrhage. And again, so the amount of bone marrow edema, how long does that take to resolve? I get asked that a lot. It's, it depends on how much there is to begin with. You know, you got 200 beers, it takes a while to drink those. If you have two beers, and I can drink that in 10 minutes. So, so generally, after, after the accident, what window do you have? I like to see a patient within two to three weeks, four weeks of an accident. I think that you're gonna get a lot of more information than if you wait six months or a year. I know that people present to you guys late and we'll do everything we can. We can expect again, we'll show abnormal bone reaction and turnover of bone going on, you know, in a long ongoing process. So that'll help. I think the earlier on, the better. And uh, Brad, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. for the first uh, three months are kind of your window for edema on MRI. And then after that, that's when the spec scan becomes more helpful. That will remain abnormal up to several months. So, you know, if you uh, have a patient and you're not quite sure of the timing, feel free to call us and we'll make recommendations on uh, what imaging is appropriate for that time frame so we can, uh, you know, relate it back to a, a date of injury. Okay. Thank you. So, so then we, we did a stir sequence, which is basically eliminating everything we just want to see water we just want to eliminate everything out and we want to see water so that's a sequence we do with that one and you can see how the, that fracture lights up even more than the t2 sequence so again if you do a stir sequence we're going to see abnormal fluid much better than we're going to see even on a t2 image clearly on t1 you don't see it um, and that's another reason why some people may not mention an annular tear or a or a stress reaction or a, a pars defect or something because they don't do that additional sequence we do on all of our scans, right? So we want to see this. this. It's a dirty image, doesn't show very much, right? But look what else it shows, which is fascinating. So you have a fracture here. I told you it was a hyperflexion injury. They, this patient tore the inner spinous ligament. So this is hemorrhage in the inner spinous ligament. That should be a limit. It's gone. There's hemorrhage in there, okay? So this is a fracture here and hemorrhage. This is an unstable spine. Okay, so it's important that we see them early and also we can see this signal here and then once it goes away and it becomes dark, then it may look a lot like the dark here or the dark here. It, we may miss it, though it's significantly there. Does that make sense? So early on the better. Oh, I'm sorry. And then you can see uh, off, off midline, there's a lot more edema and signal the paraspinous muscles and all the surrounding posterior soft tissue. So the patient had a significant hyperflexion type injury. All right, 20% of patients with cord injury have second injury at another level, okay? So if they have a cord symptom, they probably have an injury somewhere else, so we're gonna maybe expand the coverage that we do, but we do pretty good coverage at the base of the brain all the way through T1, sometimes even through T2, depending on patient size. The incidence of death in children with cord injury is 5% higher than adults. So if a child's in a car wreck, or an injury, we gotta be a lot more worried about them than adults, though we're worried about adults as well. And then cervical injuries are more common than thoracic, which is more common than lumbar, right? Because there's this 18 or 16 pound thing, for me it's probably eight pounds, it's not big. But you know, it's sitting on your body and you can do six ranges of motion with your neck. You can only do twisting and flexion with your lumbar spine and lateral bending, right? But with your cervical, you really got a lot of motion that can be really bad. Remember that if you do a plain film in your office, then 
you follow that up with CT or MRI, studies will say that 65% of the time you'll either upgrade the amount of pathology that's seen or downgrade. So 65, six or seven, almost seven patients out of 10, you will completely change what you think about that film, about that disease, that pathology, that injury. So when we say CT and MR is more sensitive, it is, and it's gonna change a lot of the uh, findings that we talk about and, and, and what, what we do. We're not just trying to cost y'all money, cost doctors money, and they say, oh, why are you recommending all these expensive things? It's because, because it's the right thing to do. It's not just frivolous, you know. Let us, let us, let us be the consultants you've consulted us to be. You know, we're the experts in imaging. Let us do that, and we'll help. So, whiplash examples. These are some of the symptoms patients will complain. This is one patient in specific. Muscle spasms, motorcycle accident, left clavicle fracture, severe posterior neck pain, and left shoulder pain. pain. Patient presents here, do you see anything? And I'm looking at it and I'm like, eh, you know, I don't know. But, oh, that disc is kind of extending posterior to the vertebral body. So there's a little disc herniation here. I'm looking for edema here. There may be some edema up in here and up in here. I don't see a fracture so far. So I do the images here, and it really doesn't show me much more, but it does show me that there's a little disc herniation here. There's effacement of the fecal sac. There's no contact on the cord. So in, some people might read this and say they think it's normal, um, but you go off midline. So you go off midline at some other levels, and you'll start seeing herniations that are far lateral. So far lateral herniations are there. You have the posterior longitudinal ligaments pretty tight and it keeps the disc from herniating in the midline. If you herniate in the midline, that's a pretty significant herniation, right? So the disc is going through that thing that's pretty strong. But to the right and left of the posterior longitudinal ligament that's thin, it's not as strong, so herniations can herniate out there slightly easier. They hit the nerves on the lateral aspect of the spinal canal, okay? Hits the cord in the middle, but as the nerves start to exit, they're hit by the lateral herniations and the foraminal herniations. So it's important that we look at the entire image from right to left. And we gotta make sure that we do, and we do cover from outside the foramen all the way through outside the other foramen. So you gotta get great coverage. The axial images do that too. All right. So soft tissue and ligament injuries and sprains and micro tears. What can we see with MRI? We see blood, we see swelling, we see tears of the disc, of the ligaments, tendons, muscles. We see micro injury of the bones, spec scans. We see abnormal activity, the bones turning over. It's trying to rebuild itself, it's been injured. Right, so that's why the bone scan is positive, okay? And we can look at fascial tears and fasciitis and all kind of crazy stuff too with MRI. So it's a busy slide, but we talked about the blood. So early on, so early on, you have hemoglobin in a cell. Okay, it's in the cell, it's in all our blood cells. And it's on T1 and T2, it's, it's isotent. It just, you just see it and it's not, it's not putting off any red flags on the anatomy or the, or the second image, the T2 image. Acute is one to two days, so now, inside the cell, you start getting deoxy, so it's no longer oxygenated, but it's still in the cell, the hemoglobin. Early subacute, two to seven days, it's intracellular, and now it's on, it degraded to met hemoglobin, and it changes its signal. T1 signal gradually starts to increase. You have T1 shortening. So now, on the T1 skin, the anatomy skin, all of a sudden, it's gonna be high, it's gonna be white. Typically, it's black, so black is early or normal. So now you start seeing that. So late subacute, seven to 14 to 28 days, the cell dies and the hemoglobin falls out of it. So now you have extracellular hemoglobin. And when you have that, over the next few weeks, you start seeing signal changes. And then chronic, it's hemosiderin, and now it's black. So black to start, black to, black to start, you don't see it. Then you start to change a little ISO signal, and then at the very end, it's dark. So if you give me a late scan, and I see something black, so are the tendons, ligaments, posterior annulus, they're all black normally because the protons can't move in the magnet, okay? So it's better to get it early. So you gotta kinda grab them kinda early, okay? So you can make the diagnosis. So some of the terms that we use in our reports or you uh, see from your uh, physicians that, uh, that you correlate with is radiculopathy, which is extremity pain from something central out. Myelopathy, which is injury of the cord, mylosis cord. Arthropathy is anything that affects the joint. So your facet joints, your uncle vertebral joints, or true synovial joints, your elbow, your shoulder, your knee, they're the same thing, right? Spondylosis is just spurring. It's synonymous with spur. So bone spur is spondylosis. And why we spur is, again, there's an injury. If it's your knee or if it's your spine, 
the, there's a little bitty micro hemorrhage where the ligaments, um, I'm sorry, the, the annulus of a disc will start to pull away from the bone where it attaches, the Sharpie fibers, and it starts to hemorrhage. And then the body does what? If you have good enough calcium, it starts to lay down bone. And so it lays down calcium in that hemorrhage. So you start developing spurs. Spurs in and of themselves are normal. They're curative. They're trying to stabilize the spine. The problem is there's a finite space for the cord and a smaller space for the exiting nerve roots, okay? So once you start spurring, you're gonna be at risk for hitting the cord or hitting the exiting nerve roots. We, and we see that very easily on MRI. And spondylitis is inflammation. It could be infectious or it could just be the most traumatic inflammation, okay? So radiculopathy, what causes it? What, what causes it, again, a busy slide, is um, it, it's caused by contact on an exiting nerve root either by a disc herniation, a bone spur, or spilling of the proteoglycans and polysaccharides in the nucleus pulposus that's now extended beyond the annulus. So the internal jelly is outside the donut. You know, it's good if you're eating it, but once it hits that nerve, it irritates the nerve. So you get symptoms. So you can have compression from a herniation. You can have irritation from the nucleus bathing the nerve or a bone spur. So three different things. So we, again, bones are much better seen on CT and the, and the types of scanners that we have at DIS. We can see the bone spurs. We can calculate the size of the foramen. We can look at the amount of area. We can actually see the physical contact on the exiting nerve roots. We see the herniations on the nerves. And in MR, we can see the bones too. But that's sometimes I'll say, you know, CT correlation may be beneficial in this patient as the majority of the pathology appears bony. Right? I don't see a herniation, but I'm seeing a lot of bony spurring, right? And so sometimes we'll do that and you say, well, but why don't you do the MR? You say it's better. Well, it is better. But sometimes CT is, is, it helps as well correlating the symptoms to better define what it is a patient has. And the most common symptom of radiculopathy is pain. It can spread from the shoulder down the arm to the fingers or thighs or anterior thighs. Again, depending on the number, and the nerve that's affected, it'll affect your lower extremities. And the patient can draw it with their a pen. It hurts here and it goes all, wraps around my thigh and goes all the way here. That could be an L4 nerve root impingement. It could be an L5. It just depends on what they tell you. But you do that. You, you see, your, your doctors will see those things and they'll calculate. Then they send us a, a, a request saying, concerned about an L4 nerve impingement. That helps us. So the more information we as radiologists get, the better because we can hone in on that. What I do when I get a request like that is I look at everything else first, then I look for that, okay? And that separates us radiologists from other doctors that read in their office. And what they do is they're looking for the thing that the patient tells them. And that's fine. It, that's great. But I've seen a lot of patients come in with cough from an outside facility with a film. And they said, the patient has a cough. And they go, pneumonia. Do a CAT scan. And I look at that plain film and I go, yeah, they got a cough and they got a little pneumonia, but the cancer that's in the right upper lobe is what's going to kill the patient. They're not looking for that. We look at everything and then hone in on what it is we're concerned about. So again, there's so many things that can cause radiculopathy. We've got to be thinking about all those things. We can't just say this, this. And unfortunately, when I was trained, and I trained and got out in 90, this disease was what it was. I mean, facets, rarely did people even comment on facet disease. Now, if you don't comment on facet disease, I'm shocked, right? But still, there's some older physicians that don't really comment. They don't think it's as significant for the patient's symptomatology as, as it turns out it is. So myelopathy is impingement of the cord, and uh, you can get all kinds of symptoms from that. Arthropathy is a collective term for diseases of the joints. And so, so I said you have arthropathy of your knee, you know, degenerative change. You know, I got to play basketball with somebody in this room, and. Uh, Man, to watch him run, it's, it's a miracle because he's got so much arthropathy. Um, no, Cesar Vasquez, by the way, is a great basketball player. He can shoot the three. I, I mean, we call him Steph because he's just, he's lights out. Uh, <laughs> when he plays basketball. He doesn't run like he used to, but, uh, but he can still shoot. Um, so all kind of arthropathic disorders afflict the spine. Anything from inflammation, you know, you got rheumatoid arthritis and you've got uh, the inflammatory arthropathies and all that. But trauma does it too. So all you have to do is take a joint 
and enrich it real quick, you know, move it in that space, you just move it. And once you do that, the capsule gets inflamed, the nerves that surround the capsule get inflamed, and in the spine, you've got all these nerves, right? Tons of nerves, right? You're close to the brain, tons of nerves. So all you need to do is move the spine just a little bit, abruptly, real quick, so it's out of motion, and then it's back to where it looks normal. But a lot of bad has happened with that motion, that quick, abrupt hyperflexion. Most patients that have a car wreck, I, I think y'all can tell me this is true, Every time I hear screeching of tires, and you have to walk the street, oh my God, they're getting ready to have the people are looking in their rear view mirror, or they're looking in their side view mirror, or they turn and look up. No one's ever going real, truly hyperflexion. They're always a little rotated, right? So I always think about that. Did the facet joint slip? Did it slide over itself? Because if it slides over and comes back, you've torn the facet joint. It's obliterated. And if you do the, if you do an X-ray, you go, huh? There's a little muscle spasm, but can't really say much on plain film that it's a normal spine, just a little muscle spasm. Additional imaging is going to certainly be helpful with a patient like that. Anything over 10 miles an hour, I mean, think about the pathology. You can move out of motion, out of place, and then back into place. The body wants to get back to where it's supposed to be, right? So it's important to consider additional information. So inflammation of the spine is infection or edema is spondylitis. So it's not infectious, it's not bacterial, it's not, you're not septic. It could just be edema or it could be infection, but typically post-traumatic, it's, it's edema. So the terms we use is degenerative chronic, I hate to use that, but you do have chronic findings. There is chronic disease. The question is, can we, after an injury, time the injury and correlate it with the symptoms superimposed on the chronic or degenerative disease, right? So the symptoms are exacerbated we can see that if the if the injuries are significant enough, we can see edema and hemorrhage. We got to look for it. We got to do the right sequences for that, and we can diagnose it. And we can quote more likely than not time it with the injury and say yes, it is likely if the patient was asymptomatic, not being treated, that now the patient has symptoms, and I see these two things, which are acute subacute findings. But again, if I wait six months, a year, a year and a half in image kind of stuck again, then it, then it all looks chronic. And maybe, but, but it's chronic relative to the injury date. But it is chronic at that point, I can't, it could have happened before the injury, it could have happened, you know what I mean? So, so it's important to get them early, I think. So again, edema, again, a busy slide, I don't know if I'll get copies of these, but the bottom line is, how long does it take to go away? It depends, again, on how much does it start with. So if you have a lot of it, it takes a while. Like in my beer analogy, 100 beers, take me a couple of months to be drink that, right? Two beers, you know, Dilio could drink that in five minutes, right? Uh, maybe four, maybe you're older now, so maybe, maybe 10. But, um, but you know, you just gotta think about how, how much there is and then it will dissipate over time. So what are the legal implications? We're, these are the things that we see, right? Future disability, I mean, I can't predict that. Someone else is gonna predict that. But if pathology is significant enough, and I dictate enough significant pathology, then you can imagine that the disability is probably going to be enhanced, their, their disability claim will be enhanced because there's enough pathology there. So you got to go to people and use imaging with people that understand pain management and pain intervention to then go forward with what, how can you help your clients and, and these people that, they, you know, they want to get better. They want to go back to work. They, they want to have a good life, right? Um, nobody wants to be in pain, um, and, and except for uh, some MBA or somebody not paying attention or texting, they, they wouldn't be seeing you today. So, you know, it's important. So, what are the terms we use? So, disc herniation. We use the word protrusion, which is a herniation. It's focal, and it's it's kind of real. It's a small thing, and extrusion goes longer, so it's longer than it is wide. Protrusion is kind of wider than it is long. Okay, so, but both herniations. Okay, so if I use the word protrusion in a report, I slip. I used to we used to use protrusion, extrusion, sequ sequestration, which we still use in free fragment. The free fragment is when you have a herniation and it breaks off the nucleus or the herniated material breaks off and goes somewhere else. If that happens, then it could patient could have a herniation at three four. The surgeon operates and I get a phone call, panic. Dang it! I just opened up L three four and I don't see the damn herniation. You you missed it. You, you, you stupid report. I'm like, well, that herniation I dictated six months ago, and I said it's it's an extruded fragment. Perhaps there's a cleavage plane. Maybe this thing may may become a free fragment pretty quick. It probably moved. Let's image them again. And they go, I can't. They're on the table. 
So sometimes I'll actually even do a myelogram on the table, take a picture, and sure enough, that disc herniation is now at L5S1 inferior. So it's not at the level it herniated, but it went somewhere else. So it's important, again, that if you image your herniation and, and it's a big extrusion, they, they better intervene. If they're gonna intervene, intervene fast. And then before they do the surgery, if they wait long enough, they probably should re-image right before surgery just to make sure that this thing didn't, didn't move. All right, I don't know how much more time I have. Uh, here's some examples of myelography. We still do myelography. Um, some patients want it, they can't have an MRI, right? Because they have either a cochlear <coughs> implant or some other device that's not MR safe. And so here's an example of a herniation here in a patient with a myelogram. And there, there we go with some nerve compression in the foramen of the set joint hypertrophy and uncle vertebral joint hypertrophy. So tight stenosynodic uh, foramen in the nerves that get popped on the way out. Disc herniation with contrast. We gave the patient IV contrast, and the IV contrast enhances the <coughs> veins in the paras paraspinous veins. You can see it's displaced vein. There's a big herniation here, so you know that the cord's being compressed right here, and this nerve root has nowhere to go, so it's being squeezed. Uh, and that's another example. Here's a myelogram, conventional myelogram, just confirming good contrast in the patient. And then to the right, you see the herniations and the bone, but primarily bony pathology. And this patient would benefit from maybe a percutaneous uh, nerve root block, okay, or um, an epidural transferamal ESI. Maybe a benefit initially to get them over the hump, and then they can address the foraminal stenosis and perhaps form a foraminotomy. All right, contact athletes, if you see them uh, and they come in and they're hurt, uh, but again, the same thing, it's the, it's the contact, it's the hit in the head thing, it's that. It's that injury that we see in football players, but or, or soccer players that head the ball. But but if you hit your head on the, you have something in front of you, you hit your head. It's the same thing, and, and you can see this bone marrow edema here, and you can see the herniations here, compression of the spinal cord. They're going to get sting, or they're going to get symptoms in their extremity, and um, and that's that's what it looks. So we did a we did a, a CT on this patient with stinger type assessment symptoms and. This is what it looked like, and you can see that you know that the nerves, they're gonna have neural issues, they're gonna have radiculopathy because the nerve's finite space is completely gone on the patient's right, and then on their left, not as bad. So acute bony injury, or fractures, I'm not gonna cover all those because you're probably not gonna see them initially. They're gonna be at a hospital, and they're gonna get tongs, but here's some examples. The occipital condyle is fractured here, okay? And here on the axial image, you can see the fracture line Okay, anterior RC1. So here's your fracture. Here's the top of the dent. You have different fractures. You can see all these fracture lines and the Jefferson C1 burst fractures. Look at all these fractures here. So anytime you have a ring, if you remember you went to uh, Mardi Gras and there's a little ring when you were a kid, a little plastic ring, and you dropped it and you try to pick it up and you step on it and it breaks into two pieces. You can't break a ring on one side. It's impossible. It's going to break on two sides. Okay. So yeah, yeah, you're going to see fractures on both sides. So here's your both sided fracture line here. There was no fracture on this side, but fracture here and here. Okay. Hangman's fracture, here's a displacement. Here's an unstable level. So the patient's dens. The C2 is anterior relative to C3, and the cord's kind of making an S shaped curve here. Here's your fracture lines here. So it's probably a high grade contusion of the cord. There's widening here, the interspinous space. And so you know that's a significant and unstable. Here's a DENS fracture. So again, we use, using MRI, we see low signal on the T1, okay, the bone marrow edema, high signal on the T2. So that's a fracture, that's an acute fracture. We're gonna call that acute or early subacute uh, fracture. All right. And then we look at normal x-rays. So we, we get in normal x-rays, we do a normal x-ray, and the patient hurts. So microtrabecular infraction and microtrabecular fractures can be present. If we do MRI, we're going to see that bone marrow edema. If we do a SPECT nuclear fusion scan with the CT or MRI, it's going to really hone in on which level is the most active and which one is the one that's really on fire. And that would might almost certainly correlate with the patient's symptoms. Okay. Also, with MRI, it helps us with the adjacent soft tissues. CT is not going to help us as much. Looking at the soft tissues, the MR will show the edema in the paraspinous soft tissue. So, of course, the worst injury would be the diving injury, high-impact injury, diving athletics, and then NVA as well. You can have trauma. If you're in the back seat and you're forced forward and you hit your head on the 
back side of the front seat, you can have a similar injury like this. And there's your burst fracture again of C5 with posterior bony protrusion to the spinal canal. Compression fractures are the same thing. You can get pseudo tumors from inflammation. If your patient has rheumatoid arthritis, their dens and their panis is not as strong as it should be. So there's a lot of motion there at C1 and then it's gonna hit that cord and you're gonna have issues if you have infection, and you can actually see this in children as well, when they have retropharyngeal abscess, they have uh, tonsillitis and they get an infection, and it, then if it becomes a retropharyngeal pharynx abscess, it can cause weakening of the transverse ligament. It actually can bathe that area and be bad, um, and then have instability. Here's an example of a clay shoveler's fracture or hyperflexion type injury. Here's the bone marrow edema in the vertebral bodies. We see that and we'll discuss it and we'll explain it on the uh, MRI.